big and neat bracket for vector fields. And basically, what we what we have done yesterday was a part of the technical stuff. So we uh, we have an open subset of a locally convex space. Then uh, we have defined um, the neat bracket already for two vector fields on this one subset. I mean, by basically identifying ah, uh, so by basically identifying the principal parts or something. Um, so we have um, this deep bracket x and y. Now x and y are um, uh, uh, vector fields on U. So we have defined this as uh, x on y minus y on x. And this was just remind you g, y, e. So we take the principal part, derivative. And then uh, we compose this x minus e x g and this both with y. Right. And I mean this is just fancy notation for you compose it with identity comma principal part. Okay. So this is the local formula. And um, we want to do two things. On one hand, I mean we want to see that this is actually a new bracket. So what should be clear from the formula here is that this actually is bilinear, right? Because uh, I mean, taking derivatives is linear sort of in the mapping here. And um, if we're taking a sum um, of two vector fields, this basically means to take the sum of the principal parts and the derivative is linear in the vector component. So we can take that out. And um, an easy calculation shows that this formula actually is bilinear in uh, X and Y. Okay, anyway, so we, uh, what we have done yesterday, uh, just keep in mind, so we have, uh, we have um, done the following two things. So we uh, have written the vector fields on M, choosing an atlas, we apologize to them as the C infinity function, uh, basically by identifying a vector field X. With the family uh, atlas, uh, and uh, and uh, so we just send this x to the principal part or the local representative of the of the x, and we call that the x by the projection of the second component. So this was the formula for the local representative. And basically, um, so for these local representatives, we can define the C bracket. And um, all of these local representatives, they are related. I mean, when, I'm, when I start with the vector field, map them over here. The subspace I get, or the, the image of this, uh, of this mapping, which um, we called Kappa, I think. Yesterday, so we use Kappa to define a topology here of vector fields and um, which turns vector fields into a locally convex space. And also, uh, the image of the Kappa consists of all uh, those uh, families of, of these local representatives which are related to each other by the change of charts. So, whenever I have an overlap between two charts, then uh, the local representative uh, on one chart is. Um, related by the change of charts to the other representative. And uh, so the last technical lemma we approved yesterday was if you have um, two pairs of vector fields which are related by a smooth map to each other, then also the lead bracket of, uh, uh, one, uh, of the, uh, the, uh, one piece of vector, uh, so, uh, so xi is f related to yi. Then the lemma said that uh, also the bracket of x1, x2 is f related to the bracket of y1. Right? So the d brackets preserve this related relation. Uh, I haven't used this not uh, notation yesterday, but this is not my short handle for the uh, xi and uh, this is f related to yi. Right? So, um, not writing them up. Okay, and so the point is, on every one of these uh, of these spaces, we have our local uh, or the 
thing which we claim is a leaf bracket. Uh, that's, I mean, we need to show that this actually satisfies all the requirements of a leaf bracket. And what we can do is to define a leaf bracket on the VM. We just use a cover, shove everything on the right hand side, then use on every one of the pieces this definition of leaf bracket. Um, and since the leaf bracket preserves relatedness and the subspace here, which is the image of the cover, is exactly all the families which are uh, change of charts related to each other, um, then this shows that if we take the leaf bracket for all the pieces in the family, then we still get an element in, kappa, uh, in the image of kappa, because relatedness is preserved by the brackets. And therefore, if we want, we can pull back everything using this mapping kappa to get a unique vector field on, uh, on, on, the, uh, on all of the manifold. Right. So, so this is the idea of how you define globally this bracket. And all we have to do is we have to check, I mean, first of all, we have to check that this actually is a leaf bracket. So um, bilinearity is not a problem, but we have uh, to check, for example, the Jacobi identity. And this is, uh, maybe if, uh, as you might imagine, this already looks painful if you're looking at this, because the Jacobi identity is we have to take iterative brackets uh, uh, with three vector fields involved, and probably we don't want to compute that ourselves, um, at least not, uh, not in this formulation. And uh, so we are uh, using a standard trick. Uh, this was asked yesterday during and after the, the lecture several times. Can we, can't we interpret uh, the vector fields as a derivation on the smooth functions and use this? And actually, this is the trick I'm going to use. Um, and I We'll just comment this, uh, a little bit on uh, what the difference is between finite and infinite dimensional uh, uh, finite and infinite dimensional uh, um, situation. Okay, so let's start with the definition. And um, so I, I just because um, I don't know whether everybody has seen this. Uh, I just want to remind what the derivation. So let uh, A here be an associative algebra. Um, And uh, so it's an exercise, which is again a little bit tedious calculation to see if you have the derivations. I mean, they're obviously a subspace of um, 
uh, of, of all the linear mappings and they actually form a uh, mean sub algebra. So basically, if you restrict this V bracket to uh, the set of all derivations, and the, so the V bracket of two derivations turns out to be a derivation here. Uh, so um, basically, it's an exercise. And um, while this is still something to compute here, we will exploit this. Uh, uh, we will exploit this to show that the lead back effective is which we defined is actually. Uh, I mean, I'm always saying the back effective is sort of a little bit talking ex uh, ex posteriori about this. Uh, because I already know that the upshot will be that the string we've defined will be a leap bracket. At the moment, we don't know. But we will use this um, derivation in the algebra to prove that uh, we actually have a leap bracket. Which, uh, so, while this computation of the Jacobi bracket is also painful, it's not nearly as painful as if you take sort of the, uh, the usual definition. Of the bracket effective fields and try to work out what the iterated bracket of these two things is. Uh, in addition, this perspective has also the nice advantage of being connected to uh, the point of view of how a lot of people think in finite dimensions about, um, <coughs> uh, about the um, about vector fields. So let's uh, now see that vector fields actually act as derivations on smooth functions. So we take again an open subset uh, of a locally convex space. Um, we take x in let me use one u and um, let us define um, oh, and we take f a smooth function. From the with various things to the reals. Right, and now, so since the reals have a nice multiplication, um, so I can use the pointwise product, which gives me an algebra structure on the smooth functions, right? So by pointwise adding and multiplying, here I get, uh, so this guy here, uh, the smooth functions, they actually form an algebra. Uh, I should mention, on this side of the blackboard, we have nothing topological going on. So um, here, we didn't touch any sort of topology. This is all abstract algebra, if you want. And uh, so one should see the next arguments, which I'm, which I'm doing now, basically as, as a purely algebraic argument. So, I'm, so the point will be to see that the vector, uh, vector vector field satisfies the Jacobi identity, well, and uh, some of the second uh, algebraic identity that the bracket of an element with itself gets zero. This is this is already clear from the usual definition. However, all of this uh, this climbing we are doing now is basically to get the Jacobi identity, and uh, so all of these results, uh, or all of these uh, all of these uh, techniques, will be useless to deduce something about the continuity of the. Of the Lie bracket. I mean, I, when we were talking yesterday about the whole thing, I uh, said, "Well, it's very important that our Lie bracket is continuous with respect to the locally convex topology." We will have to do that in another step. So at the moment, it's just sort of the algebra which is uh, which is important here. And uh, so let's define uh, mapping Lx. So um, and we just define it as Lx. Composed with x again. This is the lead, lead derivative, if you want, for this for the smooth function. And um, of course, I can write this df of the identity on the XD part. Just remind me, this should look familiar. Like yesterday, yesterday we chose to denote these guys here, uh, or we had to this notation on x point f. So I'm, I'm making a little bit of a, bit of a point here by taking this uh, this new notation because the x point f has actually the same definition. However, we applied it to functions which uh, could have values in a locally convex space. 
right? And uh, so the, uh, this notation here is now reserved for smooth functions which always take the image in the reals. That's uh, that's the point why uh, we have this new notation. I mean, in principle, I could also use the point notation, so there's nothing wrong with it. I just want to make the point that these guys here actually go into this algebra of, uh, sorry, actually act on the algebra of um, smooth function equations and reals. Okay, and uh, so simulation shows. That if I take s of f times g quantized product, then this is uh, x f and g plus f and g. So, well, okay, I'm cheating now. We should, one should really do the calculation, but I'm not doing it here. So, uh, since this is the usual calculus uh, rule, so we get the Leibniz rule. So, what this means. Uh, so n at the x in uh, our vector field can be used. Um, we have that Lx, this is a derivation of um, the algebra of C inclusive function from C. Okay. Good. Um, so, um, and now we basically want to study the map, um, or we are, uh, what what are the properties of this operation of taking a vector field to L of x. So it will turn out that um, um, this operation has some very nice properties. So in, on one hand, it's uh, it preserves, or we will see that it preserves the leap bracket. So if I take um, uh, if I take L of the Lie bracket of two of these elements, it will turn out that it's the Lie bracket in the derivation uh, Lie algebra of uh, the operators Lx and Ly if I take the Lie bracket of uh, x. Okay, so let's write this right down and then prove it. And this, uh, this will then allow us to use that Jacobi identity is true from. The validity of the Jacobi identity on this the algebraic derivations. So let's see. Again, the set is the same as before. We have um, an open subset of the local convex space. Um, and let me then make several statements. So if I take L of the lead bracket, it turns out that this is uh, X composed with uh, Y minus uh, Y. X, or in other words, this is the knee bracket of X and LY. Second thing is uh, so I can, of course, define a map L from the single functions U, or in other words, the vector fields, uh, with values in E, taking values in the derivations, and the single functions U. Field. And uh, we send x to Lx. Uh, so the is linear and injected. And the last statement is the press we define. So 
let's before we uh, before we go into proof this, let's uh, take a look at this. So, what this mapping L here will allow us to uh, since uh, so it's a linear injective mapping, and uh, what we can do is so we, we want to check the Jacobi identity for for this vector. This is the only thing which is not clear yet. So uh, we want to show that. Um, uh, so let's start actually with the proof of C. We want to prove the Jacobi identity. So this is cyclic permutation of uh, x, y, d of these brackets, and we want that this should be zero. Okay. So what we can do, we can apply L to this cyclic permutation. This one, and now, first of all, we know L is linear, so we may take it inside of the sum. L commutes with the bracket, so we may commute L with this bracket. So, what the result will be this is the Jacobi identity for the operators Lx, Ly, Z. Right now, we know that the derivations. Are in the algebra, so we know the Jacobi identity. Yes, we know that this needs to be zero. Yes, this is the second thing I'm showing. Without, unfortunately, without, without knowing at this point that, uh, that on the left hand side we have a deep bracket, but yes, and I mean, if you, if you compute just the Jacobi identity, not with this lazy trick I'm using, with some lazy trick I'm using, then, then this is exactly what I'm showing. This is the algebra. Um, so I get to find the algebra homomorphism, but uh, yeah. so as with the deep group homomorphism, deep group homomorphisms are group uh, morphisms which are uh, smooth. The algebra homomorphisms are linear homomorphisms, uh, so are linear maps which preserve the group. exactly. <laughs> yes. Okay. Yeah, I'm sure. Okay. So and we know that uh, for the speed derivative is injective. So if uh, well, if it basically sends an element to zero, then the element needs to have been zero. So therefore, uh, this computation here, the derivation algebra, implies that the Jacobi identity holds in the original algebra. Right? And this is the sort of the trick. So the, well, once we have A and B, we uh, we get C. Mm. That is small calculation. Um, before, uh, okay. I'm now cleaning the board. We have the group A and B. Um, one comment for, for those who have seen the construction in finite dimensions. Um, so you might notice I just claim that this is injective. Right? In finite dimensional situations, this is actually a bijection between. Um, well, okay, here the vector fields and the derivations of, of this algebra. In infinite dimensional spaces, there are counterexamples. So we can show that in general, uh, this mapping L here cannot be surjective. So uh, you can construct explicit counterexamples where, where, this, where the surjectivity fails of this mapping. Um, and as I understand the state of the art, so you might wonder a little bit. Here we are already always working locally, right? And um, can uh, I mean in principle, you can also write down such a mapping on uh, for the full manifold if you want, right? So you take a vector field and, and do it on on the full manifold. And uh, if I understand it correctly, the state of the art is still and it was like 10, 15 years ago. Uh, the state of the art is uh, that if you replace your open set here with an, uh, with an, uh, with an infinite dimension manifold that it's currently unknown whether this map will be injected. There are no counterexamples as you uh, know yet, but at least the argument which shows the injectivity is not clear. So this depends on uh, the open subset of the uh, loading on the space. So this is a bit weird. I think most people would expect that it's still injective, but uh, the, the argument uh, is not known. So, um, 
This algebra homomorphism is typical in infinite dimensions, and in finite dimensions, it's always an isomorphism. Yes. Ah, yes, well, on the manifold, yes, I mean, for the, for the open subset, that's not a problem. Yes. So, if you have a specific layer, the DNS Um I think so, yes. So, the main, the main issue is, of course, so. Um, uh, I just added a little bit later sort of a new chapter on uh, the existence of bond functions, which we haven't discussed. So if you look into the appendix A of the, of the lecture notes, there's a sort of a short overview of uh, when new bound functions exist. And um, this, I mean, on Hilbert's, or many quotes model on Hilbert spaces, which are paracompact, this is not a problem. But as soon as you go to Barnard spaces, uh, the upshot is there that there are some very ugly Barnard spaces, which don't allow uh, I mean, you can basically uh, you can basically construct counterexamples of, of ugly Banach spaces, which don't even allow C1 bond functions, while, and therefore also no C1 uh, partition of unity, and then you're then you're running into problems here. So I think if you have, so yeah, okay, good comment. I mean, the main issue why it's difficult in infinite dimensions is because you cannot assume that you have a partition of unity where you can just sort of build. Or custom build vector fields in neighborhoods and catch them together, or something like that, or um, sort of start with some with vector field which is constant in one direction, then use a bump function to actually uh, enlarge this thing to a, to a smooth vector field on top of some or something like that. And so this this is the main issue uh, of why this becomes a more difficult problem than finite dimensions. Okay. So let's see. Um, Let's prove now A. Um, okay, so we basically want to look at Lx composed then with Ly, and we want to apply this to a function, right? And it turns out here again we use uh, we had yesterday this formula. What happens if you take the second derivative of, of something which looks like this? Df uh, is the x and then you have uh, something like this, right? So that was that was a somewhat involved formula. When you take a derivative of this, this is something the second derivative of f plus the first derivative of the uh, of f, and then you get a derivative in this component. So um, the formula again reads like uh, uh, like follows when you go to the I mean the main issues here. So this is the f of um, no, I didn't. Probably we should uh, put let's evaluate this in u. So this is the f of u. Um, y. Uh, y. Right. So I'm suppressing now the subscript. So uh, this will always be a principal part, right? Because we are we are just identifying vector fields, not just some function of u to u. So uh, now working out for uh, this formula we have which is d squared f of u y of u uh, x of u um, plus d f uh, u d y uh, u of u probably I'm missing the bracket here. Yeah. Okay, so this is one half of the D bracket, and uh, we see again if we anti-symmetrize, because this here is symmetric in, I mean, if I now exchange the roles of X and Y, which I do to compute the D bracket, yeah, then we see that this second or this higher order term vanishes again by Schwartz rule, right? So this is symmetric in Y of U and X of U. And uh, so if I reverse the roles of these, these guys vanish, and then we are only left with these guys. 
Yeah, that was uh, and somewhat similar to this calculation yesterday we saw when we showed that related message preserved by the bracket. Okay. Um, right. Uh, well, and so this is already the proof for this because when you um, apply now, um, um, basically this was the errors to uh, y of these guys and we apply to f x this is these guys called the f uh, u y minus Now we remember that the f of u, once we fix the u, this is linear in the second component. So we can take the minus stuff over here, that we just cheat and do this. Okay. <laughs> well, I mean, if you're taking notes, this is cheating. <laughs> okay. So, uh, and what we see here is the f evaluated in the new bracket. Uh, of y with x, right? And uh, what? Okay, this is then L on f. And this shows a, right? This exactly shows that this L of this d bracket is the d bracket of the L's. Okay. Right. Uh, so linear and injective. Um, well, linearity of this guy is basically here. Uh, we don't we have, uh, let's see, uh, x plus y f in u. This is gf u x no, I'm always doing only the addition multiplication works. I mean, scalar multiplication works. This, and then we see since it's linear, the second component we can just move it out. So this is uh, L x u plus uh, y f u. Uh, so this was linear with respect to the addition scalar multiplication. Uh, okay, let's optimize this for scalar multiplication. Uh, plus S times Y, S is a scalar now, plus S plus S. Okay. Right, so uh, similar, similar argument. Okay, so this is the linearity. Uh, okay, now we know that this mapping is linear. To show that it's injective, we have no need to show that its kernel is zero. So um, for the injectivity, okay, uh, you see that the kernel. L zero. We use the Hanbar theorem. Right, and we test with linear functionals. Uh, so continuous linear functionals. Okay. Um, right. So if X is not the zero map. Right. So if it's not the zero map, then there exists a new and new such that um, x of u is not zero, and we find a linear functional such that uh, we apply the linear function to x u is not zero. Okay, so let's see what we can make of this. Um, it's a bit pleasant, I mean, actually, it's an algebraic argument most of the time. <laughs> we know we are actually exploiting that with a locally convex space, which was a bit surprising.
So we have this fun uh, with the Hanbana theorem. Okay, and now the nice thing, uh, so now I wrote this E dash, but the nice thing is, well, the E dash sits, so this is continuous linear, continuous linear means smooth in the Bastiani sense. So therefore, this sits inside the algebra of C infinity function from U with values in R. Okay, uh, sorry. Shouldn't write it like this. It's actually, it should sit inside the. This is, of course, not sitting inside this algebra. To make sense of the signatures, it should go here and there. Obviously, I can restrict the lambda just to. Um, um, yeah, so I. Uh, what would I want to do? Um, yes, so I. Uh, Okay, let's let's see how, how this uh, goes. So, we, uh, ah. so I can I mean I can also let uh, this vector field act as a derivation on uh, on this algebra. So let's see. Um, okay, the signatures here. But let's let's see what happens if I just apply this guy to this smooth function. Um, so I get that uh, R is a cost. Uh, so actually, it should be lambda respect to U. Well, this is still a smooth function. It's not linear anymore, but uh, we know what its derivative is. So let's uh, evaluate this in the U. Uh, and with U, I mean this U, right? So let's see what happens. So we get V lambda of u uh, in the direction of x u. Now, so the I mean we have restricted the lambda to get something which lies in the correct algebra where we can take the uh, um, where we can use this uh, lead derivative on. However, we know of course what the derivative of this guy is because it's a linear map when we derivate this. So this is just lambda of X okay, and therefore the x or the lx cannot be the zero map, right? Because we found we found a derivation, uh, we found a function on which this does not give zero, uh, at least at one point. So therefore, the lx is not the zero derivation, and uh, this shows. Yes, and therefore not be contained in the current yeah. This shows the activity as we want it. Since we have already discussed part C, this concludes the proof. And this is, I mean, apart from this Hanbana argument, it's purely algebra. Right? Um, okay. And now we are setting, I mean, we basically know. Uh, we have this nice, uh, on one hand, we know now that the uh, vector fields form a nice Lie algebra. We have this nice Lie algebra morphism into the derivations. And uh, yesterday I was, I was talking all the time about that it's so important to have continuity of, uh, of your Lie bracket. I mean, we already have a locally convex structure on the C infinity functions. So um, let's look at the following lemma. So we have now the C infinity function of U with something which really is a Lie bracket. The nice theorem we are after is that this is a locally convex. Leave a little bit of space here because the statement is um, so. Uh, it's again yes. So there is two directions plus and multiplication, and they are not sensitive at all. What is the relation? Because the Lie bracket is just the superposition of that two. 
applications. Yes. Uh, yes, I mean we have to take the yes we have to take I mean we have to take derivatives and then we have to evaluate from the function space perspective. This low, uh, this goes down to a limit. Okay, let me um, yeah, good point. So and, and this is actually why I was a bit late this morning uh, because yesterday evening I, I found out that oh uh, I mean originally this so okay, let's, let's look at this. So I usually said I don't want to write this adjective locally convex, right? And this is, just means the continuity of this of this uh, of this bracket. So we have to check continuity of the bracket. Uh, however, I want to make really make this point here um, because the continuity. Uh, let me prove the continuity and then show you why this lemma as I locally convex case. Let me just give you what I had in mind when I was writing the first version of this appendix. And then, yes, uh, then basically, uh, this the continuity of the bracket was left as an exercise. So we have, um, we have actually, uh, um, we have actually uh, a nice topology. So we take the compact open C infinity topology. We know that this is now a locally convex space with respect to the compact open C infinity topology. So it makes sense to talk about continuity. Um, so, and uh, so I was feeling very fine with myself. So I thought, okay, this is a nice exercise for students. Let, let them compute continuity. And then when I went home yesterday, I just realized that the proof I had in mind doesn't work in general. But okay, let's, let's see. So proof, first of all, uh, compact open simplicity topology. Uh, first, C infinity, UT into vector space. Okay, great. So we have a topological vector space. This was one part we needed. Now we only need to check continuity. Okay, and we can use these all these function space techniques we know. The, the main issue here is actually that, um, even coming back to your question, that um, it's not a con uh, so we, we are making a continuous product, so it's not the commutator uh, continuous product coming there, at least not with the natural uh, topology. So we don't know yet whether this L operation here respects sort of the natural topologies on, on these things. So that's uh, so we can't use this as a topological embedding. And uh, so let me let me show. What the issue is. Let me give you a function space proof of the statement, and then we'll see that I've accidentally, well, no, no, this is for didactic purposes, so I left out a crucial uh, assumption on uh, the space E actually, uh, which will make my proof work. And uh, unfortunately, uh, the assumption is, is one we don't want to take. But uh, I'll, I'll tell you a moment. So let's see how this works or doesn't work. So we have a locally convex space and um, Emma two two one. That was one of these function space uh, propositions we had. Um, uh, where do we have it? Uh, shows that the E bracket will be continuous if Head join map, set me for the so just give this a new name. So I call this head join map T now. No, sorry, X, Y, and U, and then two. Of x and y. Uh, u. However, actually, I don't. I want to look at the simpler problem because the bracket is given by these two terms as given as d y u x 
of u, right? And then minus the thing where we flipped the roles of x and y. Obviously, if this mapping here is continuous, because we are in a locally convex space, then also this mapping minus the one where we flip the roles of x and y will be continuous. So that if this guy here is continuous, then the joint map of the leaf bracket will be continuous. And uh, it's uh, part of the statement of this lemma 2 to 1 that if we know that this adjoint map is continuous, then also the leaf bracket has a mapping. So we call the leaf bracket as a mapping going from the C infinity function from U to C. Time to copies of this into the C infinity function from U to C. This is sort of one part of the exponential law, if you recall. Um, so the main issue here is everything would be simple if we were in a situation where the exponential law was true. Unfortunately, we are not in a situation where the exponential law is true. So this, this guy here is not in general the canonical manifold. This is the main issue here. Why this uh, there's something to prove here. So okay, let me let me show how you how do you see that this mapping is uh, is continuous. Uh, let me do some efficient notation here. I, let's do the following thing. So we are actually going uh, here into um, the C into the function C. Uh, see what um, C times E so values B C times um, U times E. Okay, let me let me tell you what this mapping does. So it takes x, y, and u and sends those guys to we send those guys to the following. So we send it to D Y. U and the evaluation of x in u. Okay, so recall here I need to write C for compact open topology. So we have seen that the compact open C infinity topology is actually initial with respect to these mappings associating to map the D. Right? So the first component is continuous just by definition of the compact open C infinity topology. Well, this is just sort of you take this triple and project to U in the second component. This is clearly continuous in X, Y, and OU. And now we have this guy here. And this is the offender. So we know that on functional spaces, the evaluation mapping is uh, continuous and uh, it turns out to be even smooth. In our appendix, we have proved this if the source of the function space, or sorry, in this function space, if the source of this function space is locally compact. If this guy is locally compact, that means that we have an open subset of a locally convex space uh, which is locally compact. Therefore, the locally, com uh, the locally convex space is itself locally compact. Every locally uh, convex space which is locally compact is automatically finite dimensional. And this is, of course, annoying if you want to have a locally convex algebra uh, for an infinite dimensional deep group, right? Because then the manifold and also the model spaces, I mean, here we are working locally for the leaf bracket of vector fields. We want later to dis uh, discuss leaf brackets of, uh, of vector fields on our leaf group. So I, I haven't explained to you yet how to go from this Lie algebra of vector fields to the Lie algebra of the leaf group. But it will have something to do with the Lie algebra of vector fields on the infinite dimensional leaf group. And now my proof, and actually I don't know better proof. Uh, so this only works if the manifold and its model space are finite dimensional because we need the continuity of the evaluation mapping here. Actually, 
this uh, statement we have on the continuity of the evaluation mapping is a little bit uh, too weak. Uh, so you can actually be a little bit better here. Um, you can actually extend this results where we have used local compactness. You can uh, extend this to uh, so there's something um, you have heard about uh, of case spaces. So there's actually a proof for in the case space world that this works. Um, however, on one hand, I don't want to go there, and in general, also the model space for infinite dimensional uh, uh, Leibniz won't uh, satisfy this assumption. So okay, now I have to now I have to uh, show you uh, how do I build this uh, how do I build this mapping P where we have all of this stuff here now, and now. Well, how do I get up to E now? Well, I'm taking another evaluation and I send this. So, the mapping doing it is you evaluate dy in the cube of u, the evaluation x and u. So if evaluation mappings are continuous, then everything's fine. We get a continuous uh, bracket here with respect to the function space topologies. Unfortunately, at least with our, uh, our methods, I then need to assume that everything's playing out in finite dimensions. So this is the proof that in finite dimensions, uh, so if you and uh, is finite dimensional space, then this guy here is an infinite dimensional locally convex D algebra. Depending on the infinite dimensions, debate, depending on what E actually is, it's zero dimensional space. Like However, so, um, well, on one hand, this concludes our, um, our, our uh, appendix on uh, vector fields and their E algebra. So, unfortunately, so the general statement which I can offer here is only that the C bracket will in general be only continuous with respect to locally convex structure if the space is finite dimensional. You can extend it a little bit, but it's not essential. And uh, right, so I guess it's time now to take half an hour of a break. So the, uh, um,